in our last video for our project, we had opened Photoshop and converted our image to um, RGB, I'm sorry, CMYK, and prepared it for InDesign. But in this video, we're going to actually use InDesign, and we're going to place that image and play around with some typography. So to create a new file in InDesign, I would go to File, New, Document. <clears throat> now when InDesign first opens, you may have the New Document window up. The keyboard shortcut is Command-N on a Mac, Control-N on a PC. Now the first thing I want to do is uncheck Facing Pages. And for this project, the format is 8 inches by 8 inches, which converts to 48 picas by 48 picas. Um, the margins right now are fine, and right now I only need one gutter. And for my bleed and slug, I don't really need to set a slug, but I do want to set a bleed to 9 picas, which is P9. That is equivalent to an eighth of an inch. If I were to type in 0.125 IN, which is an eighth of an inch, you'll see that this will automatically convert to P9. Um, 9 points is equivalent, again, to an eighth of an inch. Now I'm going to click OK, and I will have a blank document. Um, I know in Creative Cloud this uh, pasteboard is gray. The red line indicates how far out my bleed for my images go. This space, this eighth of an inch bleed, is just space that will be cut off. Um, it's more for uh, when you print something, you might cut things slightly off. So if you have an image going off the edge of the page a little bit, if you're slightly off, you won't notice it. The black line is the actual edge of the page, so you design to that line, the images go to that line. And then the pink or purple line is the margin. Uh, typically we don't want to put body copy past this pink line because it'll be too close to the edge. Now I'm ready to place an image in InDesign. Um, to place the image in InDesign, I would go to File and Place. And I need to go to my area that I'm uh, working on. Uh, my project uh, items are on the desktop for now, which is not the best place to be. Uh, I do need to organize this stuff a little differently. So I'm going to click on my S for Sustainability or for Sustainable TIFF. When I hit Open, now I'm not Notice I went to File, I went to File Place to get this. I didn't go to File Open. If I go to File Open, it assumes you want to open an InDesign document. So that was File Place. And I, again, went to File Place. I grabbed my S image, S for Sustainable, hit Open. And what I got is a loaded cursor. <coughs> now, you will see, excuse me, let me zoom out. You will see that I have um, also, with this loaded cursor, uh, my cursor has like a little paintbrush and a corner item. You want to go up to the far upper left corner of your document uh, out there at the bleed line because we did develop this image for bleed and you want to click. Now this image is now in my InDesign file but it's not embedded. If I go to my links panel I can see if I click on this that this is linked to the Photoshop file. Now the cool thing about InDesign is where um, there's additional information where I have this selected, one item is selected, I click on this arrow and it will show or hide the link information. It will tell me if I've done things correctly in Photoshop. Is this a TIFF? Yes. Is it CMYK, the color spacer mode? Yes. Is it 300 pixels per inch? Yes. So the things that you're required to do for images on printing if you've done that correctly, they'll show up in here as the right thing. Okay, so this is all showing up correct. So I'm going to close the links panel. Now, sometimes I work in layers, so I will keep this uh, image in a layer and probably lock the layer so that way it won't move. But I want to double click on this layer and I want to name it. I'm going to call it image and hit OK. Now I can no longer work in this layer if I lock it, and right now it's locked by clicking on the blank space between the eyeball image and the word image or the word layer 1. <clears throat> now 
Now I do need a new image, or new layer rather, so I click on the new layer button and this is where I'm going to put my type. So I might just say type or typography. So there's my typography layer, there's my image layer. Now what I need to do is grab my type tool. Now the type tool in InDesign is different than Illustrator and Photoshop. The type tool in InDesign you actually have to click and drag a type box before you can type in it. Now, I my word is sustainable, and I want to make sure I spell that properly, so I'm actually going to spell the whole word, and if it's not spelled properly, it will let me know, um, because I do have my dynamic spelling turned on, so it's edit, spelling, and dynamic spelling, and it will underline anything in red if it's not correctly spelled, okay? So try to remember to turn dynamic spelling on all the time. Now I'm going to triple click on this word and I'm going to hold down shift, command, and the period key which has the greater than symbol. Now on a PC it would be shift control greater than. I can blow this up. Okay. Now it is underlined green. The reason why is it's uh, questioning my grammar. If I made this a capital S it would now not question my grammar, okay? But I don't need the S after all. It's not underlined, so it's not spelled incorrectly, but I will de delete the S. And now it will underline it, and it's telling me, hey, this is not spelled correctly. Um, I'm going to keep the type box big for now because I need to run through some of the type on the uh, computer to see if I have a font or a typeface that I feel is suitable for this. Now, to run through all the fonts that are preloaded, I'm going to go all the way up. I'm scrolling all the way up to the very first um, typeface. And I have it highlighted, and I also have the sustainable highlighted. And if I just arrow down, as long as I had the typeface highlighted initially, if I arrow down using the arrow key on the keyboard, I can quickly go through the typefaces that are loaded on the machine right now. Now, um, there is a separate video on how to load fonts uh, through suitcases on the Mac. Um, that is located in the resource section of Blackboard. It's the very last item, how to load fonts. Now, if it stops, sometimes it gets stuck at these unusual fonts that don't have anything. Just highlight the font again, or if it doesn't work, just go down to the next font and then highlight it and start looking for something that will work really well. Excuse me, I'm getting a lot of email today. <coughs> now, it keeps getting stuck at this Rihanna font, so I'm going to go here beyond these first set of fonts. There's a line. I'm going to go here. I'm going to start at that typeface there, and I'm going to start scrolling down and finding something to me that exudes a sense of sustainable. Now, how does a font appear sustainable? That is a good question. So, <clears throat> depending on where we've seen type used before and how it's been used, um, it resonates a certain personality. Um, so, for instance, I would not use this black letter script called Blackmore for sustainable. That seems inappropriate because it resonates something more uh, ancient. Um, we haven't really talked about sustainability too much as a culture until recently, um, at least that I'm aware of. It hasn't been a hot topic. So, you know, this looks biblical or uh, something to do with castles or the Renaissance or something. So this is not appropriate. So it resonates something very different. So that's what I mean by resonate. I'm going to highlight the name of the typeface again. I'm going to use the arrow key to arrow down. And once I find something that feels suitable, I'll stop. But I haven't seen anything that's suitable yet. Now, I might even not have anything loaded that's suitable. So in that case, I would load, um, load a font or research fonts and load things that are more suitable. Now, just for sake of time, I may um, settle for something that is less than uh, suitable here. So I'll just plug something in here. Okay, 
that's not. Let me get something that's pseudo suitable. All right. It also could be something that looks um, visually appealing next to the big letter S that was created out of those leaves. Now, another thing sometimes I'll do is I'll research on the internet, um, you know, things that people have designed about going green, sustainability, that kind of stuff. I love to see what kind of fonts they're using um, because, uh, you know, professional designers choose particular typefaces for a reason. Um, I, like, I like this typeface. I like the fact that it's all caps, too. There's something about a stable sustainability and, you know, stability, all caps being all the same height. That, that might work out pretty well. So I'm just going to settle with that. Now I'm going to take the type box and I'm going to squeeze it a little bit. I'm going to reduce it down because you don't need, you need to get out of the habit of having large text boxes because they'll get in the way of other graphics. So try to um, make your text box the same size or same, about the same size as the uh, height of the letters. So my letters are going to go here. Let me rotate them a little bit more. And how I'm rotating them is that when you just float your cursor over the edge of the text box using the black arrow or selection tool, uh, it turns into a rotation tool. It's really cool. Now again, this black arrow tool, what I can do too is I can increase the size of this this type, but I can't do it with the type of the black um, or the uh, selection tool alone. I have to use shift and command on a PCB shift and control and I can click and drag and I can have this increase in size uh, proportionally. Now if I were only to hold down command it would not do it proportionally. Now this is a big no-no. Do not stretch type out of proportion. So I'm holding down, I, I need to hold down shift and command not just command. And I'm clicking and dragging from that note. Okay. Now the other thing I haven't talked about here is kerning, which we have talked about um, in class physically. But I need to kern this, and up here is kerning. Uh, right here where it says metrics. Uh, I'll start with optical kerning, and you'll notice some adjustments there. But kerning is the fine-tuned adjustment of, of space between two characters, between letter pairs. So I'm going to go through and, and adjust some of the kerning a little bit even more. Even though optically it looks pretty good what the uh, computer has done, uh, human beings can do a much better job at it. Okay, so I'm tightening some letter pairs. Sometimes you might um, increase the uh, space between letters. Okay, so I'm going to hold down Shift and Command again. I'm going to get this to enlarge. There we go. So I've kerned it. Um, I have created the uh, letters and put those in here. I want those to kind of fit into the S. If I want to see what I'm going to get when I print, I can hit the W key. This is a long, as soon as, you know, if you're in a type box, you're going to get a W. But if I hit the W key, I can see what I'm getting. This might need to be reduced it down a little bit. It's a little close to the edges, so I'm going to reduce this. There we go. I also might choose to color that a certain color. Now, in InDesign, assuming your InDesign is working properly, <clears throat> when you click on the box with the letters and you go to the swatches panel which is where all of our colors are you can click on the T which is the formatting that will affect the text and you can choose a color this way okay now you would think green <coughs> now you would think green uh, would be a good color choice and that very well may be now also when I'm zoomed in, um, something disturbing may be happening here, so you can see that this looks pixelated or low resolution. Uh, if I click on that image and I right click or control click on it, control click on a Mac, um, I don't have a right click mouse, but you can go to display performance and set that to high quality and you'll see that that is uh, cleaned up. Um, I still had some cleanup to do in Photoshop, but I was kind of in a hurry so I could do this demonstration. So you will see a little bit of uh, JPEG artifact noise around that that needs to be cleaned up. Now just like in Photoshop, if I hold down the space bar, if I'm not in a type box, hold down the space bar, I can move around and look for um, certain things within my layout if I'm zoomed in. Now in theory, 
um, I should be able to click on this type box, click on the T, and then I should be able to sample from my image. I'm looking for the eyedropper tool. I've lost it. There it is. It's behind the measure tool. If your measure tool uh, is not there, then the eyedropper tool will be there. But in theory, I should be able to click on any color of green within the image and apply that color of green to the type. <clears throat> and apply that color of green to the type. So I'm going to use my eyedropper tool. If I click on a dark green, oops, it hit the background because oop, there it is. So hit Command Z or Control Z. Make sure the T is selected. I've had some trouble with this the last few days. Let's see if I click on this really dark, deep green. There we go. It has looks like it's black. Uh, I'm going to try that again. I'm going to um, sometimes you have to deselect off of the box, select it again. Grab your uh, your eyedropper. Go in there and find a nicer green. Oops. Command Z. Make sure the T is selected, and try for color now. There we go. It's doing it. Now, if you can't get it to do it, what I would recommend that you do is zoom in to your image, find um, some pixels, some colors that work well for you by using the eyedropper tool. We have nothing selected. Okay. Let's say I like this range of green here. That range of green now is in my fill color or my foreground color. I can add this to my swatches panel. So I can click and drag it, and now I can use that color over and over again. So that's another way to get around it if it's um, hit or miss in working. When I click on the type, or actually I'm working a little too hard, if I use the selection tool, click on the type, click on the T, I can then colorize that type the color of green that I sampled. <clears throat> Now let's say um, I'm ready to save this um, and print it. Uh, let me go ahead and move that over just a little bit. There we go. So let me save it. So I'll go to File, Save. And you want, don't want to save it as Untitled, but I'm going to call this uh, Sustainable. All right. And it's just saved to my desktop. Now I'm done with InDesign for a minute, so I'm going to close it. We'll get back to it in another demonstration. And here I have on my desktop, I'm not very organized, my InDesign file and my images. Uh, I did create a Project One folder, which is empty, but I need to put these things into the Project One folder. That way, whenever I need to work on Project One, I know where everything is. Okay? So that organize your stuff, make sure it's ready to, for the next uh, phase, and the next phase will be packaging and getting ready for print. Thanks!